Hi, my name is Ashley Albertson, and I will be reading an excerpt from my nonfiction essay, Losses of a Pandemic to The Garden I Let Die, featured in Witness Magazine's Winter 2022 issue. Gardening has a routine to it. I thin my sprouts to promote growth, weeded regularly to ensure equitable water distribution, and watered my plants in the early morning before the sun could evaporate the crucial liquid. This cyclical pattern felt comfortable to me. Even weeding felt meditative as I listened to Fleetwood Mac and cherished the alone time with my garden. Gardening was indeed a solo effort for me, though I was happy to share the fruits of my labor. The labor itself was on my own. However, as the days got hotter and longer, and I started spending nearly all my time with Austin at his apartment, I fell out of my groove. I couldn't provide the care necessary to promote optimal growth, and there was no one picking up the slack. I wasn't watering it. I wasn't weeding it. I wasn't even harvesting what did grow. Most days, I couldn't even let myself think about it. Still, I did what I could do, giving my plants a good soak whenever I came home to grab a week's change of clothes and hoping it would quench their thirst, though knowing it wasn't enough. I avoided their gaze, looking away from the crunchy brown leaves of my raspberry plant or the arugula plants that had gone to seed. I told them I was sorry. Throughout June, we had a routine. When he woke up, Austin took an antacid. With his first meal, he took a cough suppressant, an anti-inflammatory steroid, and an antibiotic. He used two inhalers, albuterol and another, and another steroid, every four hours. He held off as long as he could between doses of opioid painkillers. Some days, Austin genuinely seemed like he was getting better, like a plant that perks up after some water. Another day, wilted, he could barely make it around his apartment. He'd lost over 20 pounds and was still coughing up blood throughout the day. Every doctor reiterated the same things, rotating through a script of, give it time, and we'll see how you're doing in a couple days. Echoes that reverberated off the walls of the dark cave in which we seemed trapped. He got his blood drawn weekly to accompany COVID-safe virtual check-ins as Utah cases spiked to almost 300 a day, where his white blood cell count fluctuated with his energy levels up and down. I vacillated between reverence for the medical expertise and frustration that after six doctors, they hadn't tried a second antibiotic or taken any more images. I wonder, had he gotten sick later when COVID cases were quadruple what they were in June, if they would have taken it more seriously? It's tricky, they'd hold us, and then again rehearse, we'll see how you're doing in a couple days. I told Austin that I'm sorry he feels this way, and I'm sorry he's not getting better, and I'm sorry I can't do more, but I will stay by his side to make sure that he doesn't stop breathing. My garden was dying. Ignored and dejected, weeds grew ever taller, hiding skeletal plants with leafless stems. The time and energy and even compassion essential to nurture its growth were desperately funneling into another vessel. I just couldn't make it work. Plants are resilient, I reminded myself, agents in their own survival. Watering once a week in the height of summer in a desert isn't enough, but the onions didn't look too bad. Maybe I thought when Austin was better, I would make a nourishing meal with these onions and maybe some small tomatoes. Five weeks after the onset of his illness, Austin had finally started another course of antibiotics. I was at 7-Eleven getting a slushy, wanting to surprise him with his favorite treat when he called me crying. He told me he had started vomiting nonstop. He told me, I need to go to the hospital now. Despite it all, I had somewhat managed to keep COVID-19 on the periphery, staying home, trusting both of our negative test results, naming the pneumonia as the big bad thing. But going to the hospital was distinctly apocalyptic. I dropped him off at the curb, watching him disappear into a dystopian tunnel lined by medical workers and head to toe protective gear. My lungs were healthy, but I too fell out of breath. On the phone, a committed doctor declared that he's not going to die in my watch. A phrase surely meant to lend comfort. It was the first time anyone had used the word die in reference to Austin. Oh, Ashley, I don't like that he said that, Austin's mom Pam told me. Austin tested negative for COVID-19 yet again, but the reprieve stopped there. The results of his CT scan revealed not only severe pneumonia, but also extensive pleural effusion, a partially collapsed lung, and several large pulmonary embolisms in each lung, which, which could dislodge at any moment and travel straight to his heart, stopping it. Austin told me this on the phone, and I couldn't sit. I couldn't stand. I wandered from room to room in his apartment, numb, not doing anything, not focusing. 
my heart began to hint at grief to a depth to which I did not have previous access, as if the potential to feel this sad or scared didn't exist inside me before. I had to believe that he would be okay to stay lucid, but I also didn't want to be naive. I existed torn in a liminal space between cautious optimism and grief, two agents at odds with one another in the space of my mind and my heart. I called my mother and told her in a whisper, almost too scared to speak the words out loud, I can't imagine a life where he's gone. In response, my 56-year-old mother risked transmission to be with me that day for a brief moment and per for perhaps the first and only time that summer I hugged my mother. At the hospital, Austin's body was inundated with substances, each fighting to give him a chance at recovery. His nose breathed pure oxygen, his veins drank fluids, antibiotics, blood thinners, and painkillers. A tube threaded through his ribs and into his lungs to expel fluid, but the surely overworked, harried nurses forgot to turn on the pump for an entire day. The concrete barrier of the hospital erected itself between us. After five weeks without leaving his side, the COVID-19 safety restrictions meant that I couldn't even visit him. Isolated and without comfort, Austin asked to hold the nurse's hand. They didn't know when he would be released. I felt guilt-written when I thought of my garden dying, of the money, time, and work I spent, and the failure as a steward to support a living, respiring entity of the earth. But eventually I accepted it was past the point of my saving, so I let it die and offered a quiet goodbye. It was a personal yet palpable loss in a sea of global bereavement. The last time I saw it, it looked like it had been reclaimed by many of the invasive plants that I had previously pulled out. Perhaps they will like this spot as much as my vegetable plants did, if not more. Perhaps it was always their home after all. Thank you.